So a few weeks ago, we talked about the analog church and the audience loved it. Well, here's one up on that entire discussion. How about we talk to the author himself? Yeah, that's right. We have Jay Kim on the podcast. Welcome to Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode. This is, I like to call this bonus content. Yeah. Oh, really? So you're not going to do the traditional premium no, content? No, this is, this is bonus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Bonus. So in addition to premium content, there's bonus content. Okay. Uh, we are thrilled today to have with us on the podcast, author Jay Kim. Everyone, welcome, Mr. Jay Kim. Pastor Come Jay. on. <laughs> yeah. So- Everybody on the podcast already knows who you are because we've talked about you at length. So you, um, you know, we're going to avoid all the long introductions and just say the guy that we talked about a couple weeks ago is here. Yeah. So welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you with us. Yeah, glad to be here. Really, really thrilled uh, to be chatting with you guys. Awesome, man! Your book, um, from cover to cover, really mm -hmm. was a riveting read. And um, I, I just, I want you to know that I appreciate the amount of work mm. that you put into this uh, because I, I, I personally benefited from it. Yep. We've had a number of uh, folks that listen to our podcast reach out and comment about the book. And um, I think it just fits so good with, with where we are at today. And so hmm. maybe we could kick off by asking you this. Um, you know, the, the Bible talks about the actions of Jesus and how mm -hmm. that if all the books were written to contain the narrative of all that Jesus did, the worlds mm -hmm. could not contain the mm -hmm. volume of the books that were to be written. So I got a question to ask you. My I, I have a a family member that was a missionary to uh, Brazil, Benny de Merchant, yep. and he wrote a book kind of summarizing his life and his mission. And, and he said the book that he wrote was like that thick, <laughs> but the editor produced one that <laughs> yeah. was you about this thick. You know it. So I guess um, the question that I would have is, do you have anything that you that didn't make the cut to get it in the book that you that that you'd like to share with our audience today um, on, yeah. on the topic of the yeah, analog well, church? Yeah. Well, first of all, Pastor Daniel, thank you for those kind words. That's uh, really encouraging and inspiring, and I'm so glad that the book has had a meaningful impact for you and and for the folks who um, are part of of what you guys are doing up there. I, uh, yeah, you know, writing a book is a, is an interesting and challenging and invigorating process and it's a long process. So I actually sure. started writing this book back in 2017, you know, so yeah. we're three and a half years out wow. from when the journey for, for this book began for me. Um, and certainly, yeah, there was a lot that was on the cutting room floor um, if I had the room and the, the capacity in that book, I would have delved deeper into, um, the, the discipleship ramifications mm -hmm. in terms of how, uh, the churches, um, often reckless leveraging of digital technologies might actually be, um, unforming, uh, the likeness of Christ in us in ways mm -hmm. that, Wow. Um, might surprise us, you know, when we dive a little bit deeper. So there's a whole slew of thoughts I have about that, about how not just digital technology, but technology in general, the way technology works, it's, it's actually intended to provide us more comfort and convenience in our lives. And that is a good thing in some ways, but also mm. comfort and convenience is um, diametrically opposed 
to uh, developing strength and skill, you know? So you think about working out, you know, or, or getting in shape or something, it is by nature an uncomfortable experience. The way we uh, develop muscles, mm. whether it's actual physical muscles by going to the gym or particular muscle memories, whether it's learning a skill like, you know, shooting a basketball or driving a manual transmission car. These are things that are uncomfortable. Initially, you have to right. actually participate in, in an uncomfortable process to develop strength and skill. Um, and so it is with following Jesus. Mm. And I think if digital technologies are designed to rob us of strength and skill because they're designed to make us really comfortable wow. and to make our lives really convenient. And so there's a lot to say about that, that I wish I could have put in the book um, that didn't make it. But, uh, but thankfully that that'll be another book for another time. Hopefully. So oh, there you go. I heard that you dropped it. I heard that another book. Yeah, we should talk about that later. Another on book. Yeah. <laughs> hey, can I jump in and ask you, um, I really loved how you talked about, although I'm very unfamiliar with the process, but online dating <laughs> and the whole swiping effect of starting or stopping relationships. Yeah. Maybe that's part of the, the next saga, but I really, I thought that was such an interesting, you know, when you apply it to our lives and our church uh, relationships, how, you know, hopefully I'm better than just a swipe, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Really. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm with you. I don't have experience firsthand. Uh, Jenny and I, my wife and I, we started dating back in 2003 um, and uh, we, we were married in 2009. And uh, so that was, you know, when we started dating, that was long before the advent of, of dating apps on, mm. on smartphones. Um, but I have several friends who are very active on dating apps. And I tell a story about one of those friends in the book. Yeah. I just, I find it fascinating because, you know, when, when we go online, um, and I do this, my family does this from time to time and, we want, you know, some food from a restaurant. It's actually yep. quite convenient that I've got an app on my phone where sure. my wife and I can just look at the menu and yep. push a couple buttons yep. and then it's magic. It's an hour later, the food's being delivered to my door. I love That's it. incredible. Yeah. And yeah. that works great when it comes to ordering food from a restaurant. But those technologies have now been applied to things that are far more complex and nuanced and important than what you're going to have for dinner. Uh, things like, um, you know, I want to find somebody that I can establish a meaningful relationship mm. with that could potentially turn into a, for the Christian, a lifelong covenantal commitment between a man and a woman. And, um, and yet we've relegated even those sorts of decisions to the same sorts of platforms <laughs> we use to order burritos. You know, so weird to me. Nights. So and weird. And that is wild. And, and, and again, it, it gets back to the point. I think psychologically what that's doing to us without even realizing it is we're also mentally and emotionally relegating those sorts of decisions to the sort of shallow decision uh, to the same level of, you know, deciding what you're going to have for dinner. It's mm -hmm. like, exactly. Because the, the action is the same on my phone. It's like deciding who I'm going to date and potentially marry is just like deciding whether I want chicken or beef in my burrito. And that mm. is not, that's not, that's dangerous in my yeah. estimation. Yeah. So I, I, I love Thai food and I love you. So yeah, let's, let's, yeah, it's let's a great combo. <laughs> yeah. Let's get together. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's, it's accelerating what was already happening before the digital age in that people in, in the Western world in particular are seeing marriage, for example, mm. as, as something that's to be taken as lightly as whether you like Thai food or not. You know, we right. see this with the increasing rise of divorce rates and people say all the time, it's like, oh, I, we're just not in love anymore. Not compatible. You know, it's a total, total misunderstanding of love. It's like, it's like the same thing as like, I don't really like Pad Thai anymore, so I'm just right. going to order something. You right. Know, and so you, yeah. you raise you raise such an interesting um, point here. And and this 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 could send us down a trail of numerous episodes, but I don't, I don't know if you've ever read the book 
um, the demise of guys. Hmm. Um, the book is tremendous. It's by Philip Zimbardo, The Demise of Guys. One of the things he mentions there, and just as you were talking about relationships, i.e. dating, applications, etc. Mm. Uh, the He really dives into, um, from a non-believer's standpoint, he, he's just a, mm. a, a, I say just, but he's a psychologist. He's mm. not, no faith connection whatsoever. He gets into parsing the difference between pornography and online pornography. Hmm. So the difference between the old school going down to the corner store Hmm. and picking up the monthly edition of Playboy versus the addictive qualities. Both are addictive, but he says there's a unique a unique dimension of mm. addictiveness to online mm. because every click is a new centerfold every mm. and and it's it it feeds off so really from a believer standpoint just so we're clear all pornography is is um is problematic at at to yep. say to say in the easiest sense of the word mm. but when you really look at it from the standpoint of the medium. So the Mm. medium is now taking that which is vile Mm. and adding an additional hook to it. Right. Mm. And, and it just makes you, you know, we, we've had this discussion a lot. How is social media affecting our, our, our young, the younger generation, Mm. our generation, you know, pseudo personalities, begin emerging behind these digital profiles of who we seem or present that we are in stark contrast with who in an analog sense we really are. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. The, the research, I'll have to check that book out. That is, yeah, I haven't thought about that, but that is right in line with all of the research about, digital mediums and digital technologies Mm. and they have not just accelerated uh, some dangerous things that were already in in existence in Western culture, but they've actually changed our experience in, in, in often quite destructive ways. So that's fascinating. And I think social media, you know, your uh, sort of parallel there to social media is really, really, um, poignant and insightful. I think that's exactly right. You know, I think it's always been a part of human experience. Um, the sinful broken human condition is that a part of that is that we are deceitful and for a variety of reasons, pride being one of the primary reasons human beings have, uh, you know, since Genesis three, essentially, we have always wanted to, present a particular idyllic picture of our lives uh, while knowing that on the interior, there was real brokenness and and sin and, and, and fallenness. And you're right. I think social media, unlike any technology before it has accelerated and changed that experience in ways that are, and I don't say this lightly, but I believe it wholeheartedly through personal experience and through all the research, it is destroying and decaying oh, the moral right. fabric of our culture. Mm. Um, unlike anything else before. And I'm not saying there weren't other things before that were doing that. There, sure. there certainly were, but social media is doing it in a way that we have never seen before. And the, those, yeah. those, fr- those moral fractures mm-hmm. are being yeah. exposed and revealed um, more readily by this digital yeah. medium. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Well, it's the whole concept that you can make a comment online and there's no consequence. Yep. So once you do that once, then you just do it again and you become this, you know, assassin online. Keyboard warriors. And you would never in a medium like this say that to, to an individual. That's right. right. And it That's creates right. this horrible online civilization basically 
where now we're 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 a species that devour each other online. Well, it's right. it's the classic. You'll you'll type something that you would never say. Oh, that's mm. for sure. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. So there's dangers and and boundaries that can be crossed digitally. Yeah. That in an I've used this as as a case in point. Um, I I try to encourage all of our church folk to be very careful with texting back and forth between opposite sexes that are not in a marriage. If, if a lady in our congregation needs to communicate with me, she can do it in a group te- group text with my wife. It doesn't take any longer to mm-hmm. set that up. And I've used this um, analogy when talking about it. If we were all standing in a group and someone came up, got a piece of paper out of their pocket, wrote a note down, folded it up, and gave it to my wife, <laughs> who was standing on the other side, yeah. who was standing, and, and, and she opens it up and reads it, writes something back on it and hands it back to him. I would have an issue with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's just weird. Yeah. But because digitally, mm. I, I believe boundaries have been broken down in that digital format yeah. that really make it easier to cross lines that that mm. in an analog setting wouldn't be crossed as readily or as easily. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I think what you guys are getting at is that an excessive use of digital mediums to communicate when that becomes our primary mode of interaction, it makes us less than human in the way God intended us to be. Yeah. Because what we're saying is in the most human sense, when we're actually with other human beings, we would never act a particular way. And yet the, the sort of digital screens that, you know, we think protect us from the consequences and ramifications Mm -hmm. of our actions um, give us, uh, and it unlocks a really broken part of who we are, where we allow, uh, well in the words of the Apostle Paul, the flesh to take over and no longer live by the Spirit. And what's really fascinating about that is the flesh, living by the flesh, you know, the, the upside down way of God's kingdom and the way Paul parses it out in his letters in the New Testament, the way of the flesh is actually less human than the way of the spirit, which is the way God intended us to live and to be mm. in the world, you know? And uh, I think digital technologies do that in us. And that's quite dangerous, as you said. Yeah. Boy, and that tension, you know, when I would do good, evil is present with me and I'm doing that, which I would not. And yeah. Man, he, he spells it out. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. So now that we've trashed technology, <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about having church using technology. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> that seems like a good idea. What do you guys yeah. think? Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Let's do a stream only online church. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. we are recording. Yeah. Yes. For a digital platform. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so I got a question to ask you as it relates to that. We already referenced it um, earlier, but. The fact that you wrote the book pre-pandemic, it would be very Mm -hmm. easy, very easy for people to conclude that the book is written in response to 2020. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. If you don't look at the date, right? Right. I mean, you just quickly, well, he's trying to combat. But the fact that the book was written prior to that Mm -hmm. is, as we were discussing before, uh, discussing before we recorded it's almost providential in a sense that uh, it was written that way so I've, I've, I've got a question uh as it relates to that is there anything is there anything that you would change adapt from this vantage point where many churches i can speak for hours mm-hmm. spent months of last year in an online only format yeah. is there is there anything that you would adapt in the book yeah. to better fit this day 
Sure. Yeah. I've been asked that question a lot in recent months, uh, understandably so. Um, you know, I think there's nothing about the ethos of the book, the core, the core tenets of the book that I would change. In fact, if anything, what the past year of this pandemic, as our church community has also been forced by, you know, county restrictions to be solely online, although now um, uh, in, in March we are moving toward in-person gatherings because the county is finally allowing us to do Thank so. Thank God for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we can't yeah. wait. We can't wait. Um, but yeah, if anything, what this past year has done for me, it's it's affirmed and reinforced the ideas that I, I propose in the book. I think that most people, even the strongest proponents of digital church or a digital ecclesiology, I think most would agree that what this past year has revealed to us is that uh, one, it's not the same, and two, that it falls short. It falls short of um, the ideal vision of what it means to be the church, that there is certainly something lacking, something missing when our church um, experience, and church is more than experience, of course, but when the body of Christ is limited to engaging only Mm. online, uh, so if anything, you know, I, I think the past year has affirmed some of those ideas. Um, if there, if there are any sort of, um, you know, amendments I would make, I get they're, they, they're not really amendments. I think more than anything, what I've learned is, and, and I'll readily admit this and have had, have admitted it before in, in some other interviews. I will say that I have more gratitude for the technologies at our disposal than I did when I first began mm. writing this book in 2017. And listen, I've never been a Luddite. Uh, The book is actually, you know, we were joking earlier a moment ago, the book is not an anti-technology book. And I make that very clear Mm -hmm. in the book. People think without reading the book, they just make some assumptions like, oh, here we go. He's asking us to get rid of our smartphones and yeah. bash computers <laughs> and just turn your own butter and live on a farm or something. Turn and not. Butter. <laughs> I, uh, I've, I, you know, I've lived my entire life still do. And I've served my entire ministry life, nearly 20 years in, in the Silicon Valley, in the hub of yeah. right. the epicenter yeah. of digital technology, which right. is one of the reasons why I wrote this book. This has just been something that's been a part of my life since I, as long as I can remember. And honestly, I have great appreciation for technology. And I say in the book, I believe digital technologies and all technologies in and of themselves are um, amoral. They don't sure. have a built-in morality. Right. Sure. The immorality and the destruction, the destruction comes by way of human misuse of any technology. Right. Right. So, you know, you put a hammer in the hand of a skilled carpenter and that technology, the hammer is incredibly useful for building uh, and for creating goodness. But you put the the hammer in the in the hands of an unskilled worker or right. more, more insidiously, you put that hammer in the hands of someone <clears throat> who has ill intentions and that hammer becomes incredibly dangerous. And so right. So it is with digital technology. Sure. So if anything, I think this past year has given me a greater appreciation for the technologies at our disposal. It's affirmed the ideas I present in the book. And my hope is that as we move forward, we have a more responsible uh, approach to, to leveraging technologies, which demands that we um, embrace their limitations and use them for as far as they will go toward creating good and then stop using them when we realize the further we go with this, it's going to be more harmful than helpful. Um, so, so those are some thoughts based on this past year. Very cool. I think you, you have a portion in your book where you, uh, I think it's a subtitle called the church is not immune and you break down the printing press and, um, you know, different phases that the church has gone through, uh, yeah that has literally changed physically the church, but yet the church has not changed. And, you know, the introduction of pews and the whole, man, it was, I don't, I don't know, you know, how you come up with the imagery of the book and the spine and the, the pews that that was incredible when I read that. Uh, But maybe it's fair to say that the pandemic will be another one of those phases where, you know, I know, 
producer Randy and myself who are on the tech broadcasting side of things here, we were reflecting yesterday, um, talking about this in preparation and saying, you know, if I look at what we have done in the past year, I have learned a lot about broadcasting technology and, you know, stuff that I would never have learned. For sure. But yeah, I don't feel like I'm less of a Christian, you know, I don't, I don't feel less apostolic. Well, but the I, process has taught me some stuff. You know, yeah. We were, we were chatting um, this morning just in, in prep for today. And I, I've used this as an example um, whenever I have talked to sound men, musicians, etc. So if, if I'm having church with 20 people in a little storefront and my six string guitar, that is as analog of an experience as it's going to get. Mm-hmm. The moment that I move to a larger venue mm-hmm. that now seats 500 people, then I have to begin enlisting technological aids to get the same job done. And so at that moment, we're putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into sound systems. The objective is that when I speak, I want them to hear me. If, if it's coming out in such a way that they hear the sound system, then it robs from the analog experience. But mm. if the digital medium of that soundboard speakers is merely amplifying the analog voice, mm. then it's a success. Mm. So it's striking that balance of amplifying the analog experience mm. without distracting from it's not about the sound system Mm -hmm. if they leave commenting on the sound system (laughs) right you failed yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. so that's exactly right that's a good way to say it to amplify the analog to to enrich the human connection between us leveraging technology digital and otherwise that's a great use of those technologies for sure yeah but we can't let them become the voice right so a question that I would I would have um, is what what's what's your what is your thoughts on this? Is it possible? Now we're in a pandemic. I'm I'm one announcement away from yeah. uh, being back to online only. If if in a setting of like we've just used with the sound system that we have. We have taken a digital transmission and we've made it more analog friendly. Is it possible to do that to cameras, streams? How is it, and and have you come up with any um, insight into how can we make the, we're forced into using this Mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. How can we make this as analog as possible? That's a great question. Uh, You know, I wish I had great practical answers. I mean, I have some anecdotes and stories, but I I think a lot of it has to do with our posture, you know, posturing ourselves in such a way that we uh, consistently recognize exactly what you said, that the tools at our disposal are best used to amplify and to enrich um, uh, our our human connection to one another and Mm -hmm. um, whatever that looks like. So a a great thing for us actually at our church, just as a small example has been, um, you know, we, we, I serve at a fairly large church here in the Silicon Valley and uh, we have a fairly large staff. So during COVID we've done this twice. We took our entire church database, the entire thing and divided people up amongst our staff. So every staff person got a list of like 50 to 70 names and phone numbers. And rather than sending a mass email, we thought, you know, something that feels more personal, um, even though it can't be in person, uh, a phone call is something, you know, people don't, we text now, you know, we don't usually call on the phone. 
And we thought, well, that feels more human to mm-hmm. at least hear a voice, yeah, to definitely. hear the nuance yeah. in their voice rather than simply reading text. Um, so, so we called everybody in our church. We've done it twice during the pandemic. So different pastors and staff sat for hours and called 50 to 70 people at our church. Uh, most of those went to voicemail, but I'd say probably a third of those calls, somebody answered and ended up being a really beautiful conversation. So even the ones that went to voicemail, we said, Hey, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email. If you'd like, you know, if anything's going on, just let us know. And almost everybody emailed back and, and all of the emails, 100% of them were like, thanks so much for calling. That is so surprising. And yeah. I can't believe you actually called me. Would love to talk to you. It just felt so much more personal than our sure. standard, something that we already do a standard kind of like a weekly all church mass email, you know, with right. some information. This was much more like, how are you? How's your family? How can I pray for you? And then yeah. it was praying for them over the phone where they could hear my voice as I was praying for them. And um, so, so I think those sorts of things, leveraging technology to help us engage and interact in the most human, most personal ways possible. Um, and, and whatever, you know, I'm sure there's a, cre- a million other creative ways that sure. churches and church leaders are going to uh, figure out to do that. But the more we can do that, I think uh, the better, the better we're going to be moving forward. Wow. Wow. That kind of, you guys remember us, we're, we're in a building fund uh, mm-hmm. campaign. And so, you know, the momentum was rolling really, really big. And, and we coming into the pandemic, we had set up this, yeah. um, Milestone Goal, milestones, yeah. every $100,000 we raise, we make homemade ice cream, and the whole mm. church would get together after a Sunday service and eat ice cream. In a very non-COVID-friendly yeah. environment, right? Yes. Everybody's yeah. together. <laughs> yeah. That was the free, not-so-free ice cream. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the most expensive free ice cream in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so we... um. We, we said, we're not going to stop this. And so we we hit the next $100,000 mm-hmm. mi- milestone. We made the ice cream. We put it all in these disposable containers. And coolers. And coolers because yep. it was summer here. And it does warm up every once in a while here. Surprisingly. Yeah. And we got in a convertible That's right. car. <laughs> and we just started going from house to house. And people were dropping off yeah. ice cream. See them come out to their front door and get ice cream, and we're sitting in the car. You, it's the same experience, right? It's like, wow, there's a human connection there. Right. We even have uh, that's we amazing. Even dogs. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Because, I mean, it's all sorts of uh, human senses that you cannot experience digitally. It's seeing somebody, you're actually receiving something in hand, you're tasting something. I mean, yeah. all those yeah. things. You can't do any of that online right can't do anything online, right. you know and that's a beautiful thing right you know? i think that the church um has the ability to adapt mm-hmm. but but your your book to me has has um aided church leaders and reminded them of the importance of staying anchored as we are forced to adapt, we've got to stay anchored mm-hmm. in in really who we are. And because there are, you know, to throw a little uh, dissension here, there are prominent voices who are saying, you know, uh, maybe churches should only be online in the future, right? Yeah, uh, I'm sure yep. you see those voices out there. We see them. Uh, we've talked about it a lot, reflected, you know, saying, yeah. you know, Man, how does that make sense? Like, should you know, you know, it's it's quite a thing. So let me ask you this: what's what's the scoop on the next book? Hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, I'm working on a, another book that is in some ways a um, a, a follow up to Analog Christian uh, a- Analog Church. Mm-hmm. And the new book, the working title right now is Analog Christian. That might change, but. Mm. Uh, I'm going to take similar ideas um, 
uh, similar questions, really. What What is the digital age doing to us? And if the first book, Analog Church, was asking the question, how is the digital age affecting our ecclesiology, how we understand what it means to be the church? Uh, this follow-up book will ask a more personal question. How is the digital age of or discipleship, what it means to be formed and transformed into the likeness of Christ very um, cool. as we follow him faithfully into a very increasingly digital world. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about it. And um, it, it should be, hopefully it should be out in, uh, in early to mid 2022. Nice. So, there you go. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Uh, one other quick question. Uh, what are your burning book recommendations right now? Oh man, that is a great question. Well, uh, so many. Um, let me look at my uh, desk follow up. Here. A follow up to that would be: How many books do you read a year? Holy cow! Uh, well, let me give you my recommendations first, yep. and then I'll try to do the math. Um, so here's one I just finished. It's called "Here Are Your Gods" by Christopher Wright. Incredible book, sort of diagnosing modern idolatry. Um, wow. We don't think of. We don't think of our affections for things in the modern world as idolatry, but so often they are. Uh, this is a great one. This is a book I've read before, but I'm reading with my staff right now, again, called Canoeing the Mountains yes. by uh, Todd Holsinger, who's a friend down at Fuller Seminary. Incredible book, particularly pertinent for the time we're in as he sort of explores what it looks like to lead in uncharted territory. Cool. Really, really helpful. Great. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, um, this is a great book. I, I just, our elders just went through this together and wrapped it up a, a week ago called beautiful resistance by John Tyson. Who's a pastor out in New York. It's about standing in, in resistance, creative resistance to, uh, some of the, the ethos of our, of our day and our cultural moment. So those are three I would recommend. And then I've got a whole slew of, uh, books about technology and stuff right here as I'm working on my <laughs> in your wheel in your wheelhouse, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's my wheelhouse. It's just something I'm fascinated by. Um, so I, I enjoy reading those types of books. Uh, total number of books I read a year. Well, here's the thing that number fluctuates uh, based on whether I'm writing a book or not. So <laughs> yeah. and actually it fluctuates antithetical to the way you would think. I actually read way more books in years that I'm working on a book. Yeah. Just mostly for research and such. So right now, because I am working on a book, I'm uh, plowing through probably two books a week, um, which is, uh, you know, it's more than my, whole, I, I have friends who read far more than that, but for me, that's a lot. But uh, on average, um, you know, I, I'd say probably, you know, I used to have this thing where I want to read as many books as possible. Mm. And some of my research into the digital age, what it's done for me is helped me realize actually what works better for me is to read more deeply, not more quickly. So yeah. um, on average, I'm probably reading uh, two books a month, something like that, mm. um, two to three books a month. Uh, and you so focus more into them. Way. Yeah. So I guess that would come out to about 30 books a year, but when I'm writing books, I'm like devouring content. So right now I'm reading two, three books a week wow. <laughs> as I'm just collecting ideas and content. Um, so there you go. Great. Wow. This has been excellent. Excellent. We certainly, um, appreciate you coming on and giving us a little more background to, as we already said, a very insightful uh, mm. book. So I, I thank you for taking time. And man, for, for one, you already have a sale That's for right. your upcoming book. <laughs> That's so, right. Put us on the list. I don't list. know if that'll put any fire under you to get, get it written sooner, but <laughs> yeah. you're going to have yeah. one sale. <laughs> when it comes time to release it, sh send us a note and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Will do. Yeah. That, well, I appreciate it so much. I appreciate um, your kind words and your support. And I'm ultimately, like I said earlier, I'm just really grateful that some of these ideas are, are having an impact or, and are, are helpful for uh, other Christians and in particular church leaders. So thanks you guys so much for, for reaching out. Great. If you haven't read it yet, Analog Church by J. Kim, it's available everywhere. So go get it and read it. It's an awesome book. That's all for now. We'll see you next time on Kingdom Speak with Pastor Daniel McKillop.